Welcome to NCIX Tech Tips. Today I'm going to be rocking some pretty sweet NCIX brand sunglasses and I'm also going to be having a look at total system power consumption from a very basic system using onboard video all the way through up a series of logical upgrades that I'm going to make to the system and I'm going to see where we end up in terms of our idle power consumption as well as our load peak power consumption for a computer system. My hope is that after watching the episode today you'll have a better understanding of how much power your system consumes whether you're running a more basic machine with a dual core processor, onboard graphics and just a little bit of RAM versus running a modern gaming beast with SLI graphics cards and overclocked quad core processor and all the works like that. All right, so our starting configuration today is an Intel Core i3-2100 dual core processor with hyper threading, very power efficient, performance per watt is phenomenal for this particular chip. It's running the onboard HD 2000 second generation graphics, so that means we've got DVI, HDMI and VGA outputs all supported off the back panel of this motherboard. We're running a very basic H61 uh, and rather H67 motherboard. We've got a basic, basic power supply. It has no 80 plus certifications whatsoever for all intents and purposes. This is just a generic power supply. We are running one hard drive and that's it. That's our entire system configuration. So at an idle, at the desktop, our total system power consumption from the wall is a mere 22 watts. As long, oh, 23 watts. Okay, so we're going to take the higher of the two numbers whenever we have any fluctuation. 23 watts from the wall. That's basically negligible. So why don't we go ahead and take a load reading as well. So what I'm going to go ahead and do, and I'm just showing you guys the overall methodology right now, is I am going to run a torture test on the CPU to draw as much power as I can on that side and then I'm going to start 3D Mark 06 with the batch size test to put as much stress as I can on the GPU and in this case the GPU is running off of the CPU but what this will do is it will give us a total power consumption of our system in order to take a baseline reading here so our total load power consumption is 48 watts which you can see on my power meter here which is just phenomenal I mean it's like less than a light bulb which is simply amazing for the kind of power that a computer can deliver these days in this tiny power envelope. Now, throughout the course of the episode, all the hardware you see in front of me, I'm going to make sensible upgrades as I go. I'm going to tell you guys why I'm upgrading the components in this order, what performance benefit I'm going to get, and we're going to look at how it impacts that baseline reading of 23 watts at idle and 48 watts at maximum load. Now our very first upgrade today is going to be a dedicated DirectX 11 graphics card. Now, Far be it from me to tell you that something like a GT430 is going to allow you to play the latest DirectX games at full HD quality, but what it does do is it accelerates some other aspects of your computer usage experience. So for example, HD YouTube videos, you can see right now on my hyper-threaded cores, the CPU consumption is quite low, whereas on my true cores, it can go up as high as around 50 to 60 percent when there is something action packed going on in this video. This can cause your CPU fan to ramp up, it can cause your CPU to run hotter. So, a lot of the time, this and other DirectX 11 accelerated applications can be improved by adding a dedicated graphics card. So here you can see with the GT430 we are able to demonstrate reduced CPU power consumption so you can see the hyper threaded cores are not really getting hit at all here. Core number one during low intensity times is under 40% usage and then spikes up to about 60% usage. Core two which found itself around the 40 to 45% usage mark is now down around 20 to 30%. So yeah, it's not as dramatic as it used to be, but adding a dedicated graphics card besides this does have some tangible benefits. Now with our video card upgrade, we we gain an extra 5 watts at idle, so 28 watts at idle. However, under load you can see that with a graphics intensive test it is running much smoother than the onboard HD graphics. While we do take a bit of a hit in terms of power consumption up to 67 watts, it is still well within reason. 
So while my dual core i3 is gonna be just fine for browsing YouTube, creating Office documents, all that good stuff, if I wanna do anything serious, like let's say encoding or editing video, I'm gonna need something with a little bit more horsepower. So for my next key upgrade, I've gone to a quad core processor. It's a little bit overkill. I went with the 2600K, which features Intel Turbo Boost as well as hyper threading. So you've got eight virtual, well, four virtual cores, four real cores, as well as extra clock speed whenever you need it. It only boosted my idle power consumption by two watts up to 30 watts and for my load power consumption and you'll clearly see that my frames per second hasn't really increased in this test so we don't get any additional graphics firepower out of the machine but we do get additional CPU resources however power load, power consumption under load goes up dramatically to about 102 watts when we are stressing out the CPU to the max and the GPU now, if I wasn't operating under the strict uh, one upgrade at a time policy that I've set for myself today, I probably would have done the quad core CPU and the eight gig RAM upgrade at the same time. So I've gone from four gigs of single channel generic RAM to eight gigs of dual channel Mushkin RAM. This uses 1.5 volts, so it is power efficient RAM. Now my idle power consumption only went up to 31 watts, so still very much under control from our original 23 watts. And, but under load, we see that it is considerably higher. So, well, not considerably, 105 watts. We're not really doing anything to stress the RAM. The reason we've done a RAM upgrade is to give us more capability in terms of a video rendering or any CPU intensive tasks where we may also require more system memory. So now that we have a reasonably decent platform, we've got a quad core CPU, eight gigs of RAM, we've now made another upgrade to our graphics card. So we've gone from the GT430, which is fine for very basic tasks, all the way up to a GTX 550 Ti. So this is what I would consider the baseline for 1080p gaming, although higher end graphics cards will deliver more performance. You can see in terms of our basic 3D Mark test here, we have more than doubled the performance over the GT430. And in real game benchmarks, it can be as much as a 5x increase. Now our idle power consumption stayed around 35 watts, but our load power consumption has jumped right up to about 145 watts, which is about a 40% increase over our previous load power consumption. Now the next upgrade we made was to our motherboard. This is going to give us higher quality components, more expansion capabilities, and it actually cut our power consumption by one watt at idle. So this is probably largely in part, largely in part, largely due to the better VRM design around the CPU socket. So it uses a 12 plus two phase voltage delivery design. It also gives us way more expansion possibilities. So now we can put in four dims of memory instead of just two. We can plug in six drives instead of only five. We have USB three, we have eSATA, we've got way more features. We can also have support for Crossfire as well as SLI dual graphics configuration. So the reason that I care about that is that now that I finally upgraded to a nice quad core CPU, which is capable of overclocking by the way, because it's a K edition and the H67 chipset is not capable of that. So there's a reason to upgrade to P67. And we've also got an SLI ready graphics card. That's a great reason to upgrade our platform. Now our load power consumption has increased while the idle power consumption has decreased, but I missed how much it's increased by. So we're just gonna start that test up one more time and have a quick look before um, so we're up to 139, wow, actually, overall system power consumption has actually gone down a little bit. So we saw a peak of 142 watts there. That's the highest we were able to measure, which is actually three watts less. So overall system power consumption under idle and load has gone down by upgrading to a more efficient, better motherboard. Now here's something you guys might not expect. We have upgraded our generic 600 watt power supply, although I pretty much guarantee if you got anywhere near 600 watts from this power supply, it would blow up. Um, and we've gone to a 1250 watt 80 plus gold power supply. Now what we encountered was something a little bit unexpected. Our peak power consumption is now 213 watts with our idle power consumption up to 88 watts. So we are running into a situation where we've actually upgraded a component too far ahead of the rest of the system. This is okay because on the graphs you'll still be able to see the relative power consumption when we continue to upgrade components, but it shows us that when you're at the very 
very, very bottom working range of a power supply, that's when it's at its least efficient, as well as at the very, very top range. So because we're running it at only 5 to 10% of its peak power delivery, that's why we're seeing such inefficiency, even though we've gone to an 80 plus gold power supply. But there are reasons other than efficiency to upgrade your power supply, such as, well, buying something that's not going to blow up and take the rest of your components with it. Now overclocking being one of the primary reasons that we even bothered to upgrade our power supply is definitely something that we're going to want to do. Now while my test bench is not really something that I'd recommend for overclocking because it does not have a proper aftermarket cooler, it is still something that people out there are doing so we might as well have a look at the power consumption implications of it. So our idle power consumption just with a modest 4.2 gigahertz overclock on the 2600K did I press run 3D mark? Now I have. Our idle power consumption only jumped about 10 watts, but let's have a look at what we're looking at in terms of load power consumption. Our load power consumption spikes up to 258 watts. So that's an additional 50, oh no, sorry, rather, 45 watts versus what we saw before we overclocked our CPU. Now that we've overclocked our processor to really give the graphics card room to stretch its legs, we've got rid of that GTX 550 Ti, we've got a GTX 570 on there, a truly high-end graphics card, at least at the time of filming. We're going to go ahead, run our 3D Mark. Uh, basically, the power consumption at idle is very good for the GTX 500 series, so it only went up about 20% to 118 watts. However, under load, we do get dramatically more performance, once again, over the GTX 550 Ti, even in this purely synthetic benchmark. But our load power consumption is now about 330 watts. So it goes up quite significantly over the 550 Ti. So now I have what I would consider pretty much a decked out system. This is the end of the road for our episode today. This is dual GTX 580s. I got my overclocked quad core, got my 80 plus gold power supply. Everything's going on with this system. You can see performance is once again, light years ahead of what I had on here before. Idle power consumption is around 149 watts from the wall. So you can see we've come a long way since our initial config where we were pulling 23 watts from the wall, which as you know is less than an average light bulb even close to some of the power efficient ones and under load we are pulling a whopping 523 watts from the wall so i want to talk a little bit before we end this about wall power versus the actual power consumption of your system so wall power is and I covered this a little bit when we changed power supplies, is affected by the efficiency of your power supply, how it takes this AC current and turns it into DC power that your computer can use. Now, by going to a big beefy power supply, we did a couple of things. We decreased our efficiency because we're not using it within its, like, its wheelhouse of optimal power efficiency, but we also are using higher quality components, which means far less of a chance when we start to put expensive motherboards and graphics cards and CPUs into our system, far less of a chance of it blowing up and taking something with it. And also, it's not all about efficiency. There's other factors like Ripple, for example, which means that the power being delivered isn't really very clean, and that can cause damage over time. So using a high quality power supply is a good idea, regardless of what it means in terms of efficiency. Although, for a low powered system, I think you can clearly see you're better off to go with something like a 400, 500 watt 80 plus gold if you want to get the best out of it in a situation like that. So I'm going to throw up a graph at the end here where you guys can see what we changed and see how the idle and load power consumption changes over time. But I just thought this would be an interesting episode. I want you guys to just post a comment. Let me know what power supply do you use and did this episode help you understand computer power consumption better than you did before. Thanks for watching NCIX Tech Tips.